Good morning, church. Did you all feel that earthquake this morning? Yes? Let's, uh, let's stand for the word. Sorry, Jesse seated you. We're just, you know, we're figuring this out again. Uh, but uh, let's read God's word together uh, as we stand in respect and under its authority. John 17, 6 through 20 is the section I want to read to you. Uh, this is the Lord's high priestly prayer. And it goes like this. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified, consecrated in truth. I do not ask for, for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. You can be seated. Um, <clears throat> Some, as I have mentioned, called John 17 the high priestly prayer of Jesus. It's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus, which is extremely significant. Um, and he's going to the Father. And by the way, this is what a priest does, as we've mentioned here before. A priest goes to the Father on behalf of, or even in place of, a people. Uh, remember, a prophet goes to people on behalf of God. A priest goes to God on behalf of people. So it's a significant prayer for that reason. It's also a significant prayer because of its timing. Jesus is going to die very soon. And he's going to God here in this prayer with kind of his last requests. Uh, the things that are really on his heart, he's going to mention now, and those things are going to be recorded for us. And I want to say this obviously reverently and respectfully, but you can tell in this prayer that Jesus has an obsession. His thoughts and his feelings and his passions here are being, I guess we would say, dominated by one topic. And that obsession, that topic of his passion is his church. His disciples, see, would become the foundation of the church. And then also his heart and passion for those that would follow the disciples, all of the believers that would come after the disciples. That's his passion. Let me just restate some of what he says in probably, you know, our own vernacular. It's amazing. I didn't read it all. But this is what he's saying in his prayer, generally speaking. He has said, he's saying all through here, Father, you have set me apart to go do something. You have sent me to do something, and I've done it. See, this is the prayer. I have completed that mission. And now they are set apart, and now they will be sent. And everything I am, everything I've done, all my energy, passion, and love has been laser-focused on this one thing, to do something for them and in them, to make them great, to make them glorious, to make them loved again, as I am loved by you, so that, so that whatever I am to you, Father, they will become to you. We are now all bound up together, you see, so that when I stand at your right hand, Father, they will stand at your right hand. So that when I receive this full inheritance of being pleasing to you, so will they. When I come back into your presence in celebration and honor, so will they. And it's so beautiful and amazing, but, but when you read it and you understand his obsession or his passion here, it's almost impossible, I think, to come away from a reading of John 17 and not have a preeminent view of God's true church. 
Jesus is binding himself to his church so that he can say to his Father God, it's impossible now for you to love me and not love those bound up in me. Do you see? And if that's true, it should be impossible for Christians, for you to love Jesus and not love his church. It's one thing to fall in love with a person who has a few hobbies, right? You fall in love with somebody who really likes shoes, or you fall in somebody who likes to fish, or you fall in love with somebody who likes to work with wood. But if you fall in love, let's say, with a man who's obsessed with fishing, so that he dreams about fishing, he thinks about fishing, all of his inward thoughts are about catching the next fish. He studies where to fish and how to fish. All the magazines in the home are about fishing before you met this guy. Uh, he, every penny that he can save goes to his obsession, his boat, the equipment, the new trolling motor, right? The new fish finder. Everything goes there. Every, every day after work, if he has a little time, he goes out to the lake. Every Saturday, he wants to fish. Every holiday, he wants to fish. Every, every, every uh, vacation, what is he going to do? He's going to want to fish. His clothes are informed by his passion. He wears fishing shirts and fishing hats, right? You know this guy. If you fall in love with that guy, it's only going to work if you're obsessed with what he's obsessed with, because that's his passion. It's the only way to have everything as a marriage move in the same direction, the only way to have conversation, the only way to get to thinking about where the resources go and what you want to do together, how you want to plan and hope together. And if you have an obsession with fishing, it just may work out. But if you think that the church is kind of like a hobby for Jesus, you just don't know him. He singularly focused his entire life, the reason he has come, the reason he has endured, the joy set before him so that he could persevere, it was for his people, the church. Yes, it was for the Father, but he already had the Father. Now, how are you going to love that person and Jesus and not love what he loves? So I don't think we can ever overstate how important it is that we're having a sermon series called Dear Church because we're addressing the great obsession, the great passion, the great joy of Jesus that allowed him to endure the cross. And I'm passionate about, about this as well because, as you know, we've been away as a family for a couple of months. And we've traveled through, I would say, honestly, we would say we've traveled through some confusion We've seen confusing places and confusing people we, who hold confusing and confounding ideas. We've bantered back and forth in our own family unit, confusing and opposing views even on racial diversity. What does it mean to be people of justice? What about the role of science in our world today? Opposing views of, uh, on freedom and restrictions, the efficacy of treatments, the power of the state to censor. What does unity look like in a family and a church? What does wisdom look like in a family and a church? We've seen with our own eyes trashed and broken cities, storefronts boarded up, rampant homelessness, anger, fear, chaos. And of course, because I was not giving advice or preaching as a family, we were able to listen. And we simply listened and listened some more. And we watched and we listened and we heard opposing views coming from blogs and books and Facebook groups and posts from friends that we love having very different opinions, and, 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 and the waters did not clear by listening. If anything, they became more turbulent and murky. And in spite of how, tur how discouraging that could all have been, we actually came together as a family wonderfully, and I, as your pastor, became even more convicted about and passionately positive of one thing. The world desperately needs God's church right now. Their decay into chaos and violence is in direct proportion to our historic lack of saltiness. Their plummeting into a darkness of various opinions is in direct proportion to our historic dimness, our covering of the light. And instead of discouraging me, I became all the more emboldened to partner with my great love, Jesus Christ, and his great love to restore, renew, and cleanse and equip his beautiful church. So <clears throat> I spent some time digging in with the Holy Spirit, especially my final two weeks, and in God's word, looking for essential characteristics of a spirit-filled church. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes into a person, you have a Christian, right? And when the Holy Spirit comes into a people, you have a church. So when Christians get together, it makes a church. And then I ask the question, well, then what must follow after that? What must we see? So I did a bit of, I guess you would call it reverse engineering, and I finally fell upon four characteristics. 
I call them the four eternal coordinates for God's church. And maybe it's easier to think of them as north, south, east, and west, or maybe more rightly as upward, downward, inward, outward. And my four sermons during this series and the Dear Church sermons, I'm going to each one be covering something about one of these essential characteristics. Now, as we do this, I do want to name a fear of mine, which may be unfounded, but I'll reveal it to you as a community caution. I'm all for introspection. It's good at times to look inward in a self-evaluating manner, but I think we have to be careful when we do that to not become self-conscious or self-inflated or we'll crash. If we sit around and we talk about the church, the church, the church, the church, we, forget, we can forget that the church doesn't come together to meet herself, right? If we talk too much about our DNA, our values, and our mission statements, we can forget that we're coming together primarily to meet and worship and exalt Jesus, his DNA, his mission, his identity, and to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us into something more beautiful, which may, may, we may have some earthly good. So <clears throat> Jacob used a really good word last week. He, he said, reset. Let's use this Dear Church series as a time for you to reset, as maybe I was able to reset while I was on sabbatical, by asking some questions as we go through this. Who are we as a church? Who are we becoming? Who should we be becoming? Not just who we are becoming, but who should we be becoming as a church? And let's put ourselves before the Lord before we move into a new space, right? That makes sense, and kind of figure out and make sure we know who we are and what we're about. Now, I'm going to give you all four coordinates right now this morning, Um, not so that you jump ahead, but that so I'm just kind of covering myself here because I want to make sure you know that I'm not going to talk about everything today, and maybe there's going to be a different topic that you're thinking, is he going to talk about, and maybe it's here. But let me just give you those four coordinates right now. First of all, a spirit-filled church will exhibit life in their commitment and submission to the authority of truth. You can call that south, the ground, or you can call it downward, being grounded in something. Secondly, and I'll talk about this next week, the church should be characterized by transcendent spiritual worship. Worship in spirit and what? Truth. And that means that's our north, that's upward. And by the way, this is the primary purpose of the church, God's people, is to worship. And so we're going to talk about that. Third, we're going to talk about dynamic covenant community. A Holy Spirit-filled church will have this aspect in their life of, 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 of this loving and being vulnerable and being committed to one another in, in our growth together. Under what? With the Spirit, under truth. And that's, you know, I could have picked east or west. I'm not sure. I think I picked east. I don't know why. But that's our inward for sure. And then there's this appropriate and vigorous witness. And what does that mean? That's the west maybe, but that's the outward the church should be showing something or being exhibiting something for the world to see. So we're going to talk about those four things in my four sermons over the next month or so, but this morning I'd like to talk about truth because that passion for Jesus, right, the church, this obsession of Jesus, his people, his disciples and those to follow, to bring a people into him so that we can be restored to glory forever. That's the end goal. All together, he's saying, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, Father, me, and the Holy Spirit he doesn't talk about, but that's the, that's the thing that's drawing us together. The church, how, how, how does he share in this text how he's going to do that? Because he does. And how the disciples are going to do it for others who will come later, and he does share that. And the Holy Spirit cord, we can say, that binds up Father, Son, and Church is going to be held together, he says, by a body of words or truth. And he mentions that several times in his prayer. So let me just repeat those, and there's others, but these these few verses. Verse 6, they have kept your word. Verse 8, I have given them the words you gave me, and they have received them. Verse 14, I have given them your word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, I love that verse because what do you see? If if you preach like me, you're like, oh, now he's given us the mathematical equation. Your word equals truth. So now we know how to define all the other words he's talking about. Your word, the words you gave me, the words I gave them, the words they received, those are all truth claims. Verse 20, now he's talking about his church. He says, I don't ask for these only. He means his disciples. But also for those who will believe in me through 
their word, the apostles' words, need to match Jesus' words. Jesus' words match the Father's words. Do you understand the process here? Jesus is talking about objective propositional truth, words that originate from the Father, brought to us in and through the Son, and which would define his disciples because of their acceptance and reception and submission under them, and would then be given from them to others, and that would therefore define those that would come after the, the apostles, the disciples, all God's church. So a spirit-filled church will have a nose-bleeding high regard for what? truth. Notice I did not say that a church should have a nose-bleeding high regard for the Spirit. Does it mean I'm discounting the Spirit? No. The Spirit doesn't want you to have a high regard for Him. The Spirit is doing something for us. In fact, John 16, 13 says, you will have a Spirit of truth, there it is again, who comes to what? To guide us into what? All truth. That's, the, that's what the Spirit's doing for the church. And this means that a spirit-filled church, from the head who is Christ, to the overseers or under-shepherds, to pastors, to, to uh, ministry uh, leaders, children, youth community group leaders, have a certain relationship to truth, whereby they will exude and exhibit submissiveness, serious study, reception, acceptance, a willingness to accept, and accountability under, uh, the, the accountability to practice, the joy in wanting to know God's words, the immovable eternal truth, because without it, guess what? There's no church. There's no church without truth. Let me try to prove how crucial this concept is in two simple points. In fact, so simple. Please, I just want you to know that I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. If I, we, I get together with other pastors and I always say, I bet you I have the most intelligent theologically church that in the, in the area. And, and they usually agree with me when I tell them about the kind of people I have, except for about three of you. But, <clears throat> and, I, and you don't know who you are, but I do. But I, I wanna make this very simple. So, so simple that you see that those are really simple statements, but they don't feel simple in our world today because the world has confused us, right? So, why is truth so crucial or essential as a necessary sign of a spirit-filled church? Well, here's why. Number one, because the truth is what creates and circumscribes a Christian. The truth is the thing that creates a Christian. The truth is the thing that allows a Christian to know who he or she is, what, what defines me as a Christian. So, the number one way you know you're a Christian, the number one way you can draw a line around your life to describe what your life looks like is through an essential relationship to or in and through the truth. About 50 years ago, ago 50 years ago or so, with the big evangelistic um, movement in America, and, and I'm not trying to disparage Billy Graham, but kind of during that time, I believe the church made a mistake by primarily evangelizing, they got one thing, right, that there's truth, but here's the primary way that churches evangelize. I was evangelized this way. You need to know, Donnie, or world, you need to know what? Truth. And if you know truth, you need to know that and receive that truth so that primarily, when you die, you can know where you're going, right? That was not entirely true. And we're finding out today that we should have been saying a little bit more. We should have been saying, you also need to know, receive, accept a certain body of truth, because without it, you won't know how to live. Do you see the difference? Truth is not something you simply accept, put it into your pocket, and someday you get to cash it. The very fabric of earthly life depends upon objective truth. The world is descending into violence and chaos. We see that, and so therefore the world depends upon the church not just being the church being secure in where they know they're going, but in the church knowing and displaying how to live on earth through truth, because it takes truth to inform and transform everything else. In fact, the last 50 years or so, we've begun to say things like no creed but deeds, which by the way is a creed in itself, so it's false. There's an argument from others that say, you know what? Our deeds are the most crucial aspect of creating or defining a Christian. Let's forget about, the, let's forget about the, the creeds or the statements of truth. Let's just do things that are great. Of course, there are many scriptures that indicate that we should have fruit, and the world knows us by our love, 
And that's a necessary sign of having received and having accepted what, though? Truth. But it's the truth that is the irreducible minimum, not a wholly or behaviorally changed life. There's an irreducible minimum that I'm talking about. Jesus is speaking here. Let me prove this point real quickly here. Jesus is speaking here of what he already has, right, and his disciples. Look at the language. I have done this, they have it, and they are mine, and they've believed it, and they've accepted it, and they've submitted to the truth, and it's in them. Now, this is before the disciples had exhibited any real life transformation. This is before Peter had denied him three times. And, and, and even after Peter's restored by Jesus, he was kind of a mess. After that, he still had to keep being transformed by the truth and by people speaking truth into his life or dreams speaking truth into his life. All the disciples would flee in fear. And yet Jesus is claiming them here, except he says, not that one Judas, not him. I'm not claiming him because he hasn't accepted truth. And he claims them on a basis of them accepting, receiving, and submitting to truth. Jesus never claims them based on how sweet or devoted. God, these are really good people, and therefore they're mine. He never claims them based on how understanding and engaged they are in social concerns of the day. His claims are not based on their glowing kindness and acceptance, inner acceptance of their beautiful new identity. He never claims them based on how far they have walked with him, the sacrifices they have made for him. No, 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 no. All of that, if it ever happens for uh, many of them, and it will, will be later. Instead, he says, I gave them truth from you. They took it in. They believed it. It's now at the center of their hearts. They're under the authority. The ruling authority is now that they are under that truth. And so therefore now, Father, I know they will be kept in it. They will be sanctified by it in time. As will all who take from them that truth that I've given them. It's the truth that's the irreducible minimum. Now, somebody might say from this sermon, oh, are you saying that truth doesn't have to change us? Please don't put words in my mouth. I'm not saying that. But transformation is not the irreducible minimum. Truth is, and the church has forgotten this. That's what we've forgotten. And that's why oftentimes, I don't know if you're this way, but I am, I read a blog or a post or even in a book about somebody, a podcast from some Christian, and here's what they say, something like this. The Lord awakened me at 4.30 this morning. I walked down the beach for three hours praying and talking to God, my Father, and I had a tearful, emotional breakthrough with him, and he really told me some things. And if you're like me, I don't, of course I don't doubt that, but it causes me to wonder if I'm a real Christian because by golly, when was the last time I talked to God three hours straight? I don't want to talk to my wife for three hours straight, and I love her, and she loves me. I don't have that many words. I don't have, listen, are there actually two 4.30s every day? Because I've only seen one of those, right? I'm not getting up at 4.30, and you just feel like, I don't know, maybe I'm not a Christian. God's never making me, waking me at 4.30. Or you hear an amazing testimony of life change. Some woman raised in a home where there's no parents and, and go through all kinds of issues and alcohol and drugs and abuse, but then Jesus shows up and everything changes. Prostitute and Satan worshiper to church Sunday school teacher and worship leader in a week. And by the way, praise God for testimonies like that. I really mean that. But if you were raised in church, people, in a church family, and you can't think of an amazing transformation in your life, probably your worst fear is to give your testimony after that person. Maybe you're not a Christian. Or maybe, maybe you know of a family with 10 kids, five of those kids adopted from various parts of the world. They sell all their earthly possessions to head off into the dark jungles of the Amazon to live off worms and banana leaves, to share Jesus with an indigenous people who have no written language. And you think, well, I don't think I'm ever going to do that. So am I Am I a real Christian or is there like, maybe there's like a B team, right? Like a, a sideline team and maybe I'll get called in some. But listen, what I want you to know is that's not true. That's unfair to them, first of all. And it's unfair to you because none of those things prove a greater Christian faith. Let me prove it to you. There are people who get up at 4.30 a.m. and spend three hours walking along the beach and crying because they see a sea turtle hatch. I know those people. There are people who display dramatic life transformation because of a football coach in their life. 
who changed their life, or because of a, the military changed their life, or because of something Beyonce said at a concert. Oh my gosh, when she said that, I just knew I'd change my life. That doesn't prove anything. There are people who give their lives to travel and live in impoverished communities in order to bring medicine, clean water, renewable energy resources. So of course we celebrate that Christians feel things, do things, change things, but those are not essential, irreducible minimum requirements. And Jesus said there are lots, there are going to be lots of people that do great things for him, and he's going to say, I never knew you. We weren't bound together by something. And if you're ever going to be moved, by the way, to a dynamic prayer life, or moved to radical life behavior, or moved like my family was to go into global mission, it's going to begin with you right now, this morning, with your relationship to truth. How much do you value the revelation of God that you're reading? Have you actually accepted it? Have you received it? Have you, been, have you bound yourself to it? Have you submitted under its authority? And then God will do what he's going to do. Show you what he's going to show in that word, and you will follow. Jesus is absolutely sure that he has these 11 disciples because he has transferred a certain body of truth into their hearts and they have believed and received them. And he's confident that it will change them and he's confident that it will bring them into the Father's glory in the Holy Spirit and it did. And that's why he came. So you say, well, why did Jesus came? Well, remember, he is before Pilate. It's right before he's crucified. What does he say about why he came? John 18, 37 Pilate asks him some questions, and he said, so you're a king? And Jesus answered, well, you say that I'm king, but this is where, for this purpose I was born. Okay, we should really be listening now. Jesus himself is telling us his purpose. For this purpose I've come into the world to what? To bear witness to what? Truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Isn't it interesting? He's he's not saying whoever listens to my voice is in the truth. Whoever is in that truth will continue to listen. To my voice. That's why they hear me. That's a beautiful scripture and one we need to remember. Because a Christian is a Christian because of a certain relationship to truth, and a Christian is defined because of a certain relationship to and under truth. Now, I'm not talking about, I need to make this caveat as well, I'm not talking about primarily intellectual agreement to some theological statements. It's necessary to understand that there is objective truth. But I'm talking about one's life positioning under truth. Mind, will, heart, emotions. A Christian will always say, I don't, get just to, I, don't, I don't just get to think what I think. I don't get to just do what I want to do. That's how they, that's how the world talks. I don't get to just feel what I want to feel. What does truth say about who I am, what I'm designed to be, who I'm designed to be, what I'm designed to do? What does truth say about how I move through life with my decisions? What does truth say about how I'm supposed to feel? Does that make sense? Don't you know, church, that your emotions are always following your truth claims? A spirit-filled church does not say, you know, we just listen to our hearts. No, a Christian doesn't just listen to your heart. A spirit-filled church tells our hearts the truth until our feelings align with truth. If you come across church Don't be embarrassed by this when people say this. It's not embarrassing. Somebody says, well, I just think that's embarrassing that God says that in the Word. I don't feel that way. I don't think I should feel that way. If you come across a certain truth in the Word and you say, I don't feel right about that, join the club. There's lots of stuff in the Bible. But what do you do is my question. Do you dismiss or change? Discount the words? Or or do you dismiss and change your heart. Do you see how confused our world is right now because God's church has gotten so confused? Listen, when Paul went around arguing in the synagogues, you have to understand this. He goes around arguing in the synagogues and the marketplaces, right? He's doing that because everybody accepted that there is objective truth. That's why you argue, by the way. That's the point of debate because everybody knew in their day someone has to be right See, do you understand? Someone has to be wrong. So let's duke it out intellectually. Let's see who's right. Let's see whose truth is the one that's actually true. And so Paul comes into these marketplaces to debate, and what he's saying is, I actually know the truth. (laughs) 
This is what I'm witness to. There's a truth that I'm a witness to. It's actually the word of God has come. It's how we move and breathe. It's how we're created. It's how we're designed. And his, he has a name. His name is Jesus. He has a face. I've seen it. He's God, but he's three in one. And we are all lost in darkness until we see the truth. He gave his life for us, and then he rose again. And everybody knew in their day that this didn't just depend on death, or maybe for them even death at all. The idea was, we don't know how to live. We don't know who we are. We don't know why we're here without objective truth. Whose truth do we live by? Paul's right or they are right. That's the battle. Peter's right or they are right. The foundation of the church has to be truth. Without it, here's what we do and what we have done. We start delving into the idea that because the world doesn't agree on truth, let's just be, you know what I'm going to say, right? Kind, loving, respectful. And maybe we will convince them of the truth, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Because when you're doing that, you're allowing the spiritless world to define what loving or kind is. Do you understand that? A Christian may or may not be seen as loving or kind or gentle or sweet in that particular culture, depending on the the particular uh, topic. So I'm tired of that argument for the church to take some sort of social position because it will help others come into the church. Who cares what the culture thinks? What does God's word say? What do we stand on? When the early Christians adopted, and they, we know this to be true, they took in, cast aside baby Roman girls, right? These Roman girls, they didn't want them, so they would just lay them out to die because they wanted boys. Christians came and snatched them up and adopted them. When early Christians walked into disease, when everybody was dying and people who were sick were cast outside their homes to die, do you really think that that was an evangelistic strategy? Often their culture accused them of being cannibals who took their babies to eat them or drink their blood. They were thieves. They were stupid, ignorant peasants who didn't understand disease. What happened with the early Christians is because they were defined by a certain body of truth, and that truth was primarily that they were loved greatly, so great, that somebody came to save them when they were at their worst And that somebody gave them something they could have never have earned, and they were saved by it, and that defined them. And those truth claims led to acts of extreme sacrifice, which showed the culture what love and kindness looked like, whether or not they knew it was love or kind. Do you understand the difference is all I'm saying? Can we see the difference in that approach that churches should take? Instead, largely speaking, the American church experience has drifted away from courageous proclamation and 100% submission and life orientation to objective truth and has done so in the name of evangelism. What are, you, what are we evangelizing someone into without truth? Let me give you an example. If somebody is wanting to jump off a 20-story building because they want to fly and they love the thought of possibly being a bird you should step up to that person and say something like this. Hey, buddy. (laughs) Uh, Hey, I I know this sounds like a cool thing to do. I love that you want to fly. I love that you want to be a bird. I sometimes wish I could fly as well. But I know for a fact that if you do this, you're not going to fly. You're going to plummet to your death. You won't grow wings, and you will die. Do you want to do that? Because if you do, you'll die. Now, if our culture is actually being honest with itself, they would see that the way I'm talking to this person, convincing them to not be a bird, is is harsh, unkind, unloving, and not empowering. Now, you'll say, but our culture doesn't think that. Of course, our culture doesn't think that. They would want me to talk that way to this person because our culture believes that gravity is an objective truth. Do you, you, you know, church, what's more objective than gravity? God? The gospel? who he told us we are, how we are to live, what we're designed to do. The words of God, the word that is God, that's objectively more true than gravity. And so therefore, because they don't believe that, we're harsh to say those words. So we are going down wrong paths as churches in America if we think that we're going to make more Christians because we have to try to be nice, kind, or loving, or empowering the way they see it. 
By the way, it's also a wrong path to think that we can make Christians because it will help them or work for them because we've tried that as well as a church. You know what? If you add this into your life, it will make you better at A, B, or C. That doesn't work either. So much so that if somebody comes to me and says something like this, Pastor Don, I think I love Jesus. I've been reading about Jesus. He seems like a great guy. I think I want to be a Christian. I'm like, great. I have a few questions. Okay. I'm hoping they're going to say, was he really God's son? Did he really die for No. If the questions are this, what will I have to give up if I accept Jesus as my Savior? Will I have to give up my sexual preferences or my sexual freedom, my ability to be and who, what I want to be in that part of my life? Will I have to give up my money because I've already accounted, this is the way we've chosen to do our life with our finances and resources, or, or will I have to change my job because I'm, really, I'm a manager over here doing this job? I don't think the church would agree with that. Do, do you know if I will have to do that? Is, in other words, is Jesus going to get all of my business? Because I need to count the cost of whether or not I want to believe in Jesus. If somebody asks me those questions, I always shut it down and say, well, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you wanted to be a Christian. You're going to find what you're looking for almost anywhere else. I want you to come back to me when your question is, what's true? What is true about Jesus? Because if Jesus is who he says he is, and if he did what he says he did for you, and that's all true, it makes no difference what it means to your life, and you'll know that. Anything after that doesn't matter. Why? Because you found truth. How else do you want to live? But if he's a liar, and it's all fake, then it matters not that you come into it. Go get a nice book, a glass of wine, and kick your feet up. Just, live, just choose any truth then if it's not true. Here's what we need to say to the world. The truth of the gospel is that you were designed by God to live and to be perfect and complete in his glory. But communally, we fell through Adam. I'm sorry that's hard to accept, but it's true. Individually, personally, you fell by your own choices. You have rejected him as your creator, Lord, and Savior. You were hardwired to do that. You have a desperately wicked heart bent to your own way. Even now, as you're asking me questions, it sounds like you're trying to fashion God in your own image. That's evil. You're designed to a short and insignificant life with no true legacy on earth, and you are, you are moving towards eternal damnation unless something is done for you and in you. Do you believe that? Do you accept that? And if they say, no then okay, there's no place to go. I'm not going to try to do something else. I'm going to pray for you because it's true whether you believe it or not, right, church? That's true whether you believe it or not. So I'm going to pray that and pray that into your life and maybe the Holy Spirit will get you to accept that truth. Now, you come back to me and you say, yes, I believe that. Yes, you believe that you're utterly lost. Yes, you believe that you're broken and doomed without Jesus. Yes, you believe your heart is evil above all. Yes, then I have great news. And when you hear that news, you'll never say, what will I have to do? It's truth. A church stands upon objective truth, and it is what we've been given by God to do. God gave to Jesus, Jesus to his disciples, his disciples to us, and the church to do for others, period. That's what makes a church. If the church keeps making truth claims that are subjective in our world today, people will come to the church for the wrong reasons. And they will leave for the wrong reasons because they don't believe in your subjective truth claim. They should never leave over that reason. They should never come because of that reason. But a covenant community of submissive recipients of the words of life will only take positions upon objective truth claims. Because then, guess what happens? The people who come will come for the right reasons that God and the Spirit have drawn to us. And here's the great things. Only the people, the people who leave will only leave for the right reasons. People left Jesus too. He said, this is teaching's hard. Who can do it? But what we forget to understand is that's great news because those people are now closer to the truth than they were before. They're closer to a relationship to the truth than they were just a second ago. Even if they walk away, they're better off because then they know what they need to accept. So truth creates, defines, describes, circumscribes a Christian. But secondly and finally, It also sanctifies a people of God. 
Jesus makes a claim that his disciples would be purified and separated by this truth that he had given him. Verse 17 is all about that. They will be sanctified in your truth. I want to talk a little bit about how he does that in the church, how the Holy Spirit does that. Now, this I'm not talking about people outside the church now, right? I just gave the truth that matters to the world. The other stuff doesn't matter to the world. We don't need to talk about sexual immorality, drunk, blah, blah, blah. They haven't accepted truth yet. Do you see? Inside the church now, how does truth change us? I'm really happy, by the way, with how Jacob addressed spiritual growth last week because it seems like he was pressing into this idea that essentially you're not going to just grow because you want to grow. Like you can't put your Bible under your pillow, go to bed at night, and wake up and say, oh, I'm a better person now. Like I kind of, I've tried that. Like it doesn't work that way. But you also can't just as a church throw or push objective truth at people to shame them now inside the church or to attack their wills aggressively and to make them afraid of consequences. So let me just throw out some examples of how you say, okay, so how does truth, truth grow as, as a people? Let me give some examples. Paul addresses sexual immorality of all kind, by the way, and the church of Corinth. Now, he doesn't say, you'll find out that he never says in those topics, you never get a feeling that he's saying, you know what, Corinth, just pray about it and pray and just be kind to people, to the people inside the church, the Christians, about their lifestyles because maybe they'll change. Nor does he say, church at Corinth, you better stop or God's going to zap you, you're going to go to hell. Instead, he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19, let me tell you what he says. Here's the behavior modification he wants. Verse 18, do not commit sexual immorality. You see? It's right out there. This is what God wants you to not do. Flee from it. Don't commit it. That's the growth he's seeking. But now how does he do that? Does he say, for you will go to hell? Does he say, please pray about it? He says this. Verse 19, for do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom, whom you have from God? You're not your own, for you were bought with a price. Do you know, do you understand what he's saying? He's saying the reason sexual immorality is okay is because you haven't accepted truth. Sexual immorality is not a passion, emotional, I feel this way issue. It's a truth issue. And you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to work in the truth. What's the truth, Paul says? Do you not know? God created you for glory. You lost that glory. He gave up his own body to bring that glory into your body, and now it's there, and you're a temple of the holy, you're a temple of divinity. You're a prince or a princess. Your body matters to him. The reason sexual immorality is rampant in your life is because you haven't accepted. You don't really believe that truth, do you? Or you don't really believe that your body's no longer your own, right? What does our culture tell us? It's my body. God doesn't say that to the Christian. He says, your body's not your own anymore. I purchased it with a price. So maybe you're doing what you're doing because you've never really accepted what the Bible says about who owns your body. Sexual immorality is behavior that is birthed from wrong truths, untruth, and it's corrected by the Holy Spirit, assimilating, administering truth into your heart until you believe it. Doesn't matter how you feel about it. Paul says it doesn't matter how you feel. This is what, do you not know? The Bible says, do not worry. Ask someone who struggles with worry or maybe anxiety, that, and I'm talking about the kind of anxiety about worrying. Ask somebody how easy it is to just pray that they can not worry anymore. Go to bed and wake up the next day and not worry. Or just tell that person, you know what, you shouldn't worry because it's wrong and God's going to zap you, and if you don't stop worrying, you're going to go to hell. They will rightly punch you in the nose. Worry, the Bible says, comes from a lack of truth. Luke 12 tells us that knowing that God is in control, right? You haven't really believed that. Think about it. It's not just on the page. He's telling you to bring it into your heart. Do you really believe that God has the time, the management style to oversee even the right time for a bird to die? You don't believe that. You've been watching too many National Geographic shows. You just think it's chaos. You think life is chaos. You don't really believe that God is sovereign and in control. Aren't you more valuable than a bird? 
Do you know that God created you? He's known when he would bring you into the world, in the earth. You weren't born by accident when you were born, who you were born to. That wasn't an accident. He knew you since before eternity, wove, wove you into the womb. You were birthed into his glory. Only when he's ready to bring you home will you come home. That's when you'll come home. You don't really believe that, do you? You think your life depends on you. No wonder the church looks like a bunch of people worrying. Worry is a behavior born from taking in untruth and is corrected only when the Holy Spirit pushes deep into your heart the truth about God and how he runs his world. A Christian knows that every issue they have, and I mean every issue, this is how we address issues in the church, in our lives. This is how I address issues in my heart. Church, I'm, that's what I mean. Not me addressing to you. This is how we all do it together. Whatever issue I have, and I mean everything. Oh, I'm grouchy today. Oh, I'm, not, I'm upset at Heather, right? Oh, the kids really make me mad and I'm bitter. Whatever it is, grumbling, anger, fear, stinginess, racism, all of those are birthed from broken relationships to truth. You feel forgotten? You feel like God has maybe passed you over? I get it. That means you have to sit with the truth long enough where it says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And the Holy Spirit has to work that into your heart till you really believe it instead of just reading it. You feel guilty. Your heart's condemned you because of past sin. I get that too. That happens to me a lot. You need to sit with the truth that God says he's greater than our hearts and he knows all and we can rest in his presence. You sit with that truth until the Holy Spirit makes it true. You feel like you can't forgive somebody? I get it. You want me to just say as a human, I get it? Yes, I, I don't know if I can forgive that person either. But you sit with the truth that you've been forgiven even when you didn't care to be forgiven, even when you were at your worst, while you were lost. You must have assimilated along the way an untruth that you have somehow earned God's grace because you made better decisions. You said yes when somebody said no, so you kind of deserve it. Mm, the Holy Spirit needs to work in truth until you, you realize how desperate you were and how God did everything for you. And then guess what? You will forgive. You don't have to try harder. You don't have to be afraid of going to hell. You haven't assimilated truth. And if a Christian, I'm talking about Christians, not the world, if Christians respond to truths like that in the Bible as we're working with one another and talking to one another, and a Christian says, you know what? I see it. I see it, pastor or community leader. I see it, uh, friend. But, I, but, 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 you're, okay, stop. But what? You see? What, how you feel about it? Or whether or not that's been your experience? You don't have a Christian until there's a common submission to authority of the word. And then we can nicely discuss what the word is saying. You see? But we all come under its submission. You can't have somebody who says, I see it, I just don't feel that way. Well, then we don't have a Christian, because if a Christian can't grow, we don't have a Christian. By the way, this is the way we were saved. Don't you see that, church? This is, this is our great communication to the world. Jesus did not come on point with his Father in obedience and just whistle his way to the cross. <whistles> Always look on the bright side of life, right? Like, that's not Jesus. He didn't whistle his way through his pain. He wrestled. What? What did he wrestle with? He submitted. What did he submit under? He cried. The Bible says he didn't get his way. He wanted to submit to the, an authority under which he was under, under which he was witnessing to, under which he was giving to others. Jesus did not die because he wanted to be forsaken by his father. He did not die because he wanted to become sin. He did not die because he wanted to experience darkness and hell in our place. He's reaching out to his friends in his final moments, hoping they can help him carry the burden of submission to truth, and they rightly can't do it. They fall asleep. He goes over, he cries, he comes back, he cries, he does this over and over again. What's he asking God? Is there any other way? What's my out? An angel comes and I believe starts helping him to apply truth. The entire word of God, you, Jesus, you're testifying to this moment in history. You were sent to do this. It was planned for you to do this. From the beginning of time, you were purposed to do it. All of who God is, your father, will be seen through the truth that you're about to show the world. 
And this is the only plan in which creation, including people, can be redeemed and restored. You don't have to do this. But the question is, what matters most to you? How you feel as a human, your desire, your fear, or will it be God's truth? And Jesus says, not my will. He's submitting. Thine be done. I submit to truth. It took a night, but in the end, the Bible says he stood up and he died under submission to the word, as the word, and for the joy to be with his creation once again in paradise. Somehow, some way, in submission to God, the truth, Jesus lost his own way, if you know what I mean, the way he wished it would go. But then he still gained his father and gained millions and millions who he will bring back home to the father. He actually submitted to a truth that had eluded Satan, a deeper magic, I like to call it. And he didn't let his very reasonable concerns and feelings, feelings determine his outcome. He never said, but I feel this way, so that is what I will do. And he did all that so that you cannot be forsaken in that same truth. Do you know who was forsaken? The one who cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me so that you can claim the truth of the scripture that says God will never leave nor forsake you. And that's the way of a Christian to the world. That's what they should see. And now my question for the church today is whose truth are you listening to? What truth are you bringing into your life? Who's defining you? Under whose authority are you? Who's growing you? Who's changing you? Who's transforming you? What truth is at the center of your life? Because there is something there. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you for the truth for which you came to witness to, under which you died to save us, and because of which you rose again into paradise. Father, help us to see that not just as a way that we do life or a way to die and go to heaven, but a way in which we live all of our life as submissive people under the authority to God's word. And that will make us look crazy at times. It'll make us look mean at times. It'll make us look wonderfully kind at times. But what the world should see all the time is a humble submission to the authority of God's word. For if your son was willing to submit to it, so all his followers will as well. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.